thought we're going to carry on the discussion with uh, some issues related to constitutional and international law and immigration. Uh, we've got five panelists uh, this morning, and uh, we're going to start with uh, Matthew Lindsay from the University of Baltimore, who's going to tell us a little bit about the history of immigration law. Good morning. Uh, really wonderful to be here. I want to, uh, again, thank uh, Peter, Peter Margulies for convening this, um, Dean Milnowski, and, and also the members of the Law Review who have so much to do with kind of staging this event in the first place and who are going to be working hard in the coming months to, uh, to, to pu publish the, uh, the papers. So my, the, the title of my talk is, is The Perpetual Invasion, and the word invasion there uh, is, is supposed to be in uh, scare quotes. Uh, not only to reassure you that I don't actually think the U.S. is undergoing a, an immigration invasion, but, uh, but also to, to announce that this metaphor of, of invasion um, has, has been a rhetorical centerpiece uh, for a really long time, not only of American political culture around immigration and immigration regulation, um, but also uh, in the, the legal construction of this vast extra-constitutional uh, and largely unrestrained uh, federal power to regulate immigration. So in the next uh, 10 or 12 minutes, uh, I'd like to explain um, how the U.S. came to possess uh, this, this power and then conclude with a few words about um, what President Trump's approach to immigration, both his kind of political demagoguery and, and his actual policy, uh, might mean for the future of constitutional immigration law. So the modern federal immigration power, which is uh, commonly known as the plenary power doctrine, uh, is, is constitutionally exceptional in, in a couple of different ways. And, and first is that it derives not from any enumerated power, but is, uh, as the Supreme Court has written on many occasions, an incident of sovereignty belonging to the government of the United States. And the second way is that, partly as a result of this, immigration is really um, buffered against judicially enforceable constitutional constraints, including constraints like the First Amendment or the Due Process and Equal Protection Clauses that, at least on their face, certainly don't distinguish between citizens and, and persons. And as many of us know, the consequences of, of this arrangement uh, can be really profound. Right? Even people who've lived uh, legally in the United States for, uh, for many decades often lack robust constitutional protections against, uh, for example, often very lengthy detention uh, during uh, removal proceedings or even selection for removal based on what would otherwise be protected speech or association. Although there's a certain aura of almost naturalness that, that surrounds the inherent sovereignty model today, uh, it is in fact a relatively modern creation. Uh, the U.S. Constitution itself is silent uh, on the authority to regulate uh, immigration. Uh, and in fact, throughout the first century of the nation's history, uh, immigration regulation was neither constitutionally accept exceptional uh, nor even exclusively federal. In fact, really until the, the 1870s, uh, the states and, and localities uh, were, were the primary regulators of, of uh, foreign migration. Where then did this, this modern extra-constitutional uh, Im immigration power come from? Well, as, as Peter mentioned uh, in his opening remarks, uh, the short answer is the Chinese exclusion case, uh, decided in 1889. So in the Chinese exclusion case, uh, Justice Stephen Field uh, explained that unrestrained federal authority was necessary to, as he wrote, preserve the nation's independence and give security against foreign aggression and encroachment. And, and the opinion, which I'm sure some of you have read, famously dwells on the menace right, posed by Chinese immigrants um, uh, uh, you know, uncivilized, servile habits of, of life uh, and labor. As Field wrote, they remain strangers in the land, residing apart by themselves and adhering to the customs and usages of their own country, a, a failure to assimilate uh, that he attributed to intractable uh, differences of race. So for, for Field, uh, the effects of cheap, servile uh, Chinese labor on American workers wasn't so much a, a commercial issue as one of national security. Right, of defending the nation uh, against what he called an oriental invasion of this unassimilable race that was, as he said, dangerous to our peace and security. Right? And, and critically for our purposes today, he said such a, a policy is conclusive upon the judiciary. Right? Four years later, the court then extended this principle to cover not only 
the exclusion of, of aliens outside uh, U.S. borders, but also the expulsion of resident aliens. And, and in fact, uh, the court continues to, to this day uh, to affirm that the constitutional exceptionalism uh, of the immigration power as though it's a kind of natural, self-evident uh, uh, consequence of, of, of sovereign nationhood. So in light of the, the decisions over, you know, overt hostility toward the Chinese, it's, it's kind of tempting to interpret the doctrine announced in that case, this plenary power doctrine, as you know, a legal expression of the, the anti-Chinese racism that really pervaded uh, a Gilded Age political culture. In, in some respects, of course, it was uh, exactly that. Yet the basic terms in which uh, lawmakers and judges uh, repeatedly condemned the Chinese menace uh, were not unique. In fact, bear remarkable parallels to the nearly uh, contemporaneous critique of so-called foreign pauper laborers from, from Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, and to make sense of this, this really ubiquitous trope of, of alien invasion during this period, the late 19th century, um, and, and especially the court's uh, conflation of immigration regulation with the imperatives of national security, um, I think it helps to take a step back from the immediate context of, of Chinese exclusion uh, and to consider what I would call a broader political economy of foreignness uh, that, that really uh, apply both to Chinese and new European laborers. So over the first half of the 19th century, um, even as political and, and economic anxieties uh, around immigration mounted, uh, as nativist movements uh, gained influence, especially in the 1840s and 50s, uh, most Americans continued to uh, believe that so long as European immigrants, at least, were well diffused uh, throughout the population, the kind of warm bath of economic freedom and, and, and political fellowship would you know, dissolve away the old world residue uh, of, of kind of corrupt European monarchy, mm -hmm. instill them with habits of, of independence and political freedom and, and devotion to uh, their adopted country. Uh, in the final decades of the 19th century, though, this confidence was, was really shattered by a uh, two-front immigration crisis that uh, contemporaries judged the Cooley problem in relation to Chinese em immigrants uh, and, and, and the problem of foreign pauper labor for, for Europeans. Right? In, in contrast to the so-called foreign paupers of the past, uh, Chinese coolies and European pauper laborers uh, they, they, they competed in the labor market with a vengeance, right? They weren't dependent. They didn't siphon money out of the, the, the public purse. They competed in the labor market with a vengeance and, and offended American ideals precisely through an excess of economic competitiveness. Now, the language I quoted from the Chinese exclusion case a minute ago gives a, a flavor of this critique as it applied to the Chinese. And indeed, in the debates over Chinese exclusion, uh, lawmakers dwelled at length uh, on the destructive effects that Chinese labor had uh, on the civilization and living standards of Americans. As the, the California Senate, one of the major advocates of the Exclusion Act, uh, complained, to compete with the Chinese, our labor must be entirely changed in character, in habits of life, in everything that the Republic has required him to be. And these illustrations, I think, uh, are, are help make the point. Uh, the first, titled, What Shall We Do With Our Boys, uh, shows a, a racialized Chinese laborer. He's taking over every industry while a bunch of uh, white workers stand, stand idle. Uh, the second one, which is actually from 1988, it's mislabeled here, kind of speaks for itself, but certainly uh, invokes an image of uh, uncontrolled incursion in, into the United States. The nearly contemporaneous uh, condemnation of so-called pauper laborers from, uh, from Southern and Eastern Europe, in turn, really closely track the anti-Chinese critique to a remarkable degree. Um, in both cases, uh, fitness for the American labor market, and hence fitness to be in the country, uh, was measured by the inclination of the immigrant to maintain a respectable, what was called an American standard of living. And accordingly, uh, critics of, of uh, immigration devoted uh, really extraordinary attention to European laborers' habits of consumption, literally documenting what they, uh, what they ate and where they slept. Um, these habits of consumption, in turn, were understood to be rooted in uh, natural racial endowments associated with their, their countries of origin, right? Fixed at birth uh, and impervious to any kind of uh, acculturation. Uh, and this economic pathology critically threatened not only to degrade the labor market, uh, but also to destroy the citizenly virtues uh, of economic freedom and independence among workers. 
And, and so too did critics of European immigration echo the trope of foreign invasion that was so prominent in, in the context of Chinese exclusion. Uh, as, as one uh, US senator explained, European pauper laborers were the goths and vandals of the modern era. They come only to lay waste, to degrade, and to destroy. <clears throat> they bring with them in ignorance, degraded morals, and a low standard of civilization. And again, the, uh, the, the images here help. The first illustration really makes explicit this, this parallel between uh, Chinese laborers and, and Europeans. The, the, the guy on the right is uh, tagged as, as an Italian. You can tell by the funky pants. Um, and, and the second, which is, the second, which is uh, mislabeled, uh, it's actually titled The Mortar of Assimilation, illustrates the, the perceived failure of, of European uh, assimilation. Everybody's blending in uh, quite nicely. They're being spur uh, stirred by the spoon of, uh, of equal rights, except this uh, incorrigible Irish, knife-wielding Irishman uh, over there. Uh, so, so for both groups, right, Chinese and New Europeans, uh, the, the dangers to American political life uh, could no longer be controlled by controlling access to political participation. And this is really a, a critical turning point because now their mere presence uh, in the United States, their, their, the possibility of them participating in the American labor market threatened to degrade the quality of American citizenship. And this trope of invasion was more than just a colorful uh, political metaphor. Uh, it was precisely this, this perception of national vulnerability, right? This sense of a, a peaceful invasion by a degraded foreign menace um, that underwrote the federal immigration power, right? A, a power that more than anything was adapted to the defense of American sovereignty and citizenship uh, against foreign encroachment and, and aggression. Uh, so, which brings us back to President Trump. Uh, for, for the past uh, two years, um, Donald Trump, first as a candidate, uh, then as president, uh, has offered you know, really spectacular proof that the invasion metaphor uh, continues to resonate uh, with, with many Americans. He announced his candidacy with you know, lurid images of Mexican uh, drug dealers and rapists pouring across the southern border, a, a, uh, you know, a problem that could only be solved, he said, by constructing a big, beautiful, impregnable wall. Uh, then came the flood of, of Islamic terrorists uh, um, kind of masquerading as, as uh, refugees from the Syrian civil war. His solution, of course, a Muslim ban. This promise to protect the American people, right, their, their physical security, their jobs, their, their health, their culture, uh, against an invading foreign men menace was, as, as others have said, a real centerpiece of Trump's presidential campaign. And it worked, right? He, he won. And then all of seven days into his presidency, uh, he made good on his promise and, and passed the first of his three uh, so-called uh, Muslim bans, what he would call them that. Uh, and, and yet, I want to suggest, you know, <coughs> admittedly somewhat uneasily, that through his um, disarmingly unapologetic and, and effective scapegoating of unauthorized immigrants and, and refugees, the president has actually performed a public service of sorts at least since the end of World War II. Courts applying the plenary power doctrine uh, have generally ignored its historical provenance, right? Often not even citing the, the Chinese exclusion case, the, the, one, the place where it all started. Um, instead, they explain the you know, extraordinary breadth of, of federal authority over immigration in the much more legally respectable language of, of sovereignty and security. Now, though, the president has really uh, breathed new life into what are the long suppressed premises of alien invasion, existential threats to the, the republic, and really just unadorned nativism in a lot of cases. Uh, and he's done this with a, a kind of frankness that we haven't seen in, in generations. And this is why as apprehensive as many of us were about the Supreme Court's review of, of the travel ban, the case did appear to offer a, a really rare opportunity for the court to address the plenary power doctrine uh, head on in, in its most you know, honest, uh, unvarnished uh, uh, form. The case has, of course, now been dismissed as moot, but uh, is likely to be back before the court within a, a year or so. In the meantime, though, I wonder, perhaps too hopefully, uh, whether the, the spectacle of the travel ban may have cast a, a revealing light on another case that's before the court right now, and that is Jennings versus Rodriguez. Um, Jennings addresses whether non-citizens held in long-term uh, detention 
uh, an incredibly important issue right now. Where probably half a million or more uh, citizens will be, will be detained this year, uh, have a right to a periodic uh, bond hearing with the possibility of, of release. And although this isn't nearly as, uh, as politically sensational as, as the travel ban challenge was, uh, it nevertheless carries really important implications for the future of the plenary power doctrine. In the last time the court um, addressed the issue of, of long-term mandatory detention in 2003, it upheld a, a provision of the INA providing for detention for certain criminal aliens uh, pending removal, even when that confinement lasted well over a year or, or even uh, several years. So what does this have to do with the invasion trope? The court's decision in that case, it's Damore versus uh, Kim, relied on exactly the same national security rationale for, for plenary federal power that was at issue in the travel ban case and that will be at issue uh, going forward. Whenever the government invokes that rationale, as it has in, in Jennings versus Rodriguez, a key question, um, as Sahar talked about earlier, is, is whether the justices will look behind this bare assertion of a national security interest, right? And, and the remarkable thing is that several of the justices over the past 15 years or so have indicated a, a willingness to do uh, exactly that and to apply at least somewhat more scrutiny uh, to the government's asserted national security defense of an immigration pr provision. Uh, and I am hopeful that the, the bizarre tableau of, of the travel ban, especially the president's remarkable uh, uh, public statements, his uh, practically admitting that the, the, the focus on nations rather than religion was a, a kind of a fig leaf, uh, will put the justices in a you know, somewhat better mood uh, to think critically, to think at least more critically than they have in the past uh, about the, the, the assertion of national security as a kind of categorical warrant to do uh, whatever the, the government wants when it comes to uh, immigration. Thanks. Stephen Legonsky, Legonsky, sorry, who is the Washington University uh, Professor Emeritus and the former Chief Counsel of the Citizens <coughs> and the Immigration Service. And he's going to talk about executive power, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Diana. Whoops. Thank you also to, uh, thanks especially to uh, Peter and to Chelsea and I met Katie and Jennifer last night and all the other uh, law review students who have done such a great job in organizing this splendid conference. Uh, apart from the intellectual benefits of it, for me it's an extra bonus to get uh, caught up with uh, a number of long lost friends. So this has been great. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I see as a trend that I've noticed over the past several years. I think there has been a tendency uh, for both legal and media critics of pro-immigrant policies um, to argue that those of us who advocate those policies are really making a big mistake because all we're really doing is inviting a conservative backlash. Um, or they argue more specifically that uh, when we defend the broad executive uh, power of President Obama to issue DACA and DAPA, uh, those arguments are going to come back to haunt us when, as is now the case, we have a more conservative president whose anti-immigrant policies uh, are subject to challenge. And suddenly we have to resist some of those very same arguments about how broad the executive power uh, might be. In fact, some of the panelists who are here today, and including scholars whom I count as personal friends uh, and for whom I have exceptional respect, have made a summer all of the, these arguments. Uh, I won't mention any names. Why don't we just call them uh, well, Peter, for example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, other critics, more acerbic, um, essentially accuse us pro-immigrant advocates of being hypoc hypocrites and, in fact, short-sighted uh, hip hypocrites at that. So these kinds of arguments, I think, have been particularly common in the context of DACA and DAPA. And I believe they take at least three different forms. Uh, form number one is this. If the courts were to set a legally binding precedent upholding programs like DACA and DAPA, um, that precedent uh, would validate broad executive power and therefore would um, help to support Trump's travel ban and Trump's rescission uh, of DACA. And in fact, even outside the immigration context, is it going to help to validate other presidential non-enforcement policies, presidents who are hostile to the environmental laws or the tax laws or the civil rights laws or the labor laws uh, and so on. Form number two of the argument is, well, legal issues aside, uh, the very issuance of DACA and DAPA has changed or at least reinforced political norms uh, that presidents will be able to cite when they uh, go on to seek uh, 
uh, to exercise other broad executive non-enforcement powers. And form number three is that programs like DACA uh, and DAPA, uh, as well as other pro-immigrant initiatives, are going to trigger uh, a political backlash among the public, a uh, backlash that will in turn uh, go on to do things like help elect a president like Donald Trump, who did campaign on, a, on an anti-immigrant platform, um, and who then, uh, once in office, uh, went on to take some virulently anti-immigrant executive actions. So I, I want to be clear that um, the critics I'm referring to are not necessarily, in fact, frequently are not anti-immigrant uh, at all. Um, I know some people in this, uh, who, who are of this view, uh, whom I would describe as particularly compassionate and actually immigrant advocates in many other uh, immigration settings. Um, also, to be clear, and just to preempt um, the claim that I'm attacking a straw person here, um, I do want to say that I'm not suggesting that all of these critics have made all of the arguments that I've just described. But every one of the arguments I've just described has, in fact, been made by at least someone. So I want to take them up one at a time. First, the notion that if DACA or DAPA uh, were ultimately upheld, then those precedents would support future executive actions like the travel ban and the rescission of DACA. Uh, the implication is that there's an inconsistency between the arguments that many of us made in defending DACA and DAPA uh, on the basis of broad executive power and now resisting broad executive power when it comes to the travel ban and other things. Um, that claimed inconsistency, in turn, is on the linchpin for the other two claims. A, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites, and B, you're short-sighted hypocrites at that. Um, uh, refuting the hypocrisy critique, I think, is, is child's play. Uh, first of all, uh, if it is hypocrisy to make one argument in defense of DACA and DAPA, and then resist an analogous argument later when the shoe is on the other foot, then it is also hypocrisy to resist the arguments in favor of DACA and DAPA, and then to make make opposite arguments when it comes to defending the travel ban. So if there's any hypocrisy involved, it's charging liberals with hypocrisy, but not conservatives. Um, but I think the name calling is irrelevant. Uh, it's not helpful. And in any event, I really don't think that either side is being inconsistent or particularly hypocritical, uh, because I don't think the arguments um, are, are difficult to square. And that's because the specific legal issues that arise in the DACA and DAPA litigation have almost nothing relevant in common with the legal issues that have been arising in the travel ban case and in the DACA rescission case. Um, the only similarity I can see is one that appears at the highest level of generality. They're both, they're all involving bold executive actions that affect a lot of people, but that doesn't strike me as a particularly helpful uh, legal uh, construct. Uh, and there isn't time to do it now, but I'd be, I'd be happy to elaborate on the legal issues if uh, there's interest during the Q&A. Uh, the same is true of the concern that upholding DACA and DAPA would somehow give future presidents uh, the legal clearance they would need in order to refuse to enforce other regulatory regimes that they were personally hostile to. Um, again, we're talking about apples and oranges. First of all, Obama did not refuse to enforce the immigration laws. Uh, throughout his administration, he continued to use every penny Congress had given him for immigration uh, enforcement. And even if DACA and DAPA had both gone into effect, there still wouldn't have been nearly enough money to go after more than a small fraction of the remaining undocumented uh, population. But second, there are all kinds of limits on uh, presidential enforcement uh, discretion. I laid them out in detail in my uh, House Judiciary uh, Committee testimony that Professor Blackman was, was referring to. Uh, and I'll just refer you to that for, uh, for those uh, limits because there's not enough time to discuss them. But the main one is that every statutory structure is different. In particular, every statutory structure differs with respect to the scope of discretion that, that the legislature has granted to the executive branch. And therefore, the fact that a particular broad exercise of discretion is recognized in one statutory context tells us very little about whether analogous authority should be recognized in another statutory context. So that's all I have to say about the legal issues. Um, on the political front, uh, critics have argued that these supposed inconsistencies, and I hope I've shown that they aren't really inconsistencies at all anyway, uh, ultimately are going to be turned against us uh, politically because they'll create or reinforce political norms uh, that justify future presidents' broad claims of constitutional uh, authority in a range of regulatory settings, and that in addition they'll create a political backlash among, with the public. I think those who assert those claims are making a causal uh, 
uh, assumption, uh, that they should have some obligation to actually demonstrate rather than simply assert. Um, as for the precedent serving as political norms, it is true, defenders of DACA and DAPA uh, have frequently cited the analogous actions taken by a long line of previous presidents, especially uh, the uh, programs of President Bush Sr. And I think those actions do provide a nice make weight for some of Obama's decisions, but I can tell you from first hand, having been part of the administration and integrally involved in the rollout of DACA, uh, that the fact that President Bush had, had announced a similar program and other presidents had too, while making nice makeways, were never a sine qua non for issuing DACA and DAPA. I think the immigrant advocacy organizations deserve the lion's share of the credit for that, and the legal authority for those programs is not the fact that other presidents have done them, it's the fact that deferred action is recognized in multiple places in the statute, explicitly in the administrative regulations that do have the force of law, and in multiple court decisions as well. Um, a related complaint has been that we liberals should be advocating for still greater border security. Uh, if we want to be credible, and we haven't. But there's a reason we haven't, and I want to quote just a few statistics. Um, the Border Patrol budget is now more than 14 times what it was in 1980. Uh, the ICE Interior Enforcement Operations budget has tripled since 2004. Here's, a, here's some other stuff. From 1986 to 96, this is the period from IRCA to IRA IRA, for those who are immigration specialists or who have nothing else better to do. Um, uh, the number, during that 10-year period, the number of Border Patrol agents doubled. <laughs> then, from 1996 until the 9-11 uh, attacks, five years later, the Border Patrol doubled again. Then, in the decade following 9-11, it doubled yet again. Um, <laughs> we now spend more money on immigration enforcement than on all other federal law enforcement programs uh, combined. And second, even with these uh, continual exponential increases, in resources for, for immigration enforcement, immigrant advocates overwhelmingly supported the comprehensive immigration reform bill that the Senate passed in 2013, uh, even though that bill would have doubled the size of the Border Patrol yet again. Um, it would have added much more fence, it would have added drones, it would have added surveillance cameras, uh, it would have uh, expanded uh, e-verify and made it mandatory nationwide, it would have adopted several other measures to enhance immigration enforcement. Uh, I can't say that liberals were wild about those provisions, but we all accepted them, we were not intransigent, as the price to pay for legalization uh, and for um, en expansion of the criteria for legal immigration. Um, it is true, we liberals have generally resisted calls for turning state and local uh, police into junior immigration agencies, agents for all the reasons that Mayor Alorsa um, provided so eloquently. Um, but there are good reasons for that, as he explained, and I'd be happy to talk about those in the Q&A as well. Finally, I want to be clear as to what I am not saying. Uh, I'm not suggesting that there is no pro-immigrant policy that would be capable of spawning this kind of conservative uh, backlash. And in fact, I'll concede that if you look back at history, there have been periods where <laughs> large, sudden spikes in immigration, particularly from particular parts of the world, have spurred restrictive legislation. I think that cannot be denied. All I'm saying here is that there's simply no evidence that the kinds of um, uh, positions that critics have recently been faulting liberals for advocating um, have had any effect uh, on, in terms of uh, re uh, spurring restrictive movements. I, I find it very difficult to believe that if only Obama had not announced DACA and DAPA, well, Donald Trump would never have been elected or he would not have been able to uh, issue the travel ban or rescind DACA. I just don't believe that. Uh, nor do I believe that anybody in the Trump administration is actually citing DACA and DAPA for the proposition that the president has broad executive authority uh, to issue a travel ban. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, I predict that public opinion will ultimately, and it might take time, reverse some of these uh, particular policies. And so I say that we immigrant advocates uh, should follow our own instincts rather than be guided by what our critics tell us our strategies uh, should be. And I believe that we should continue to fight <laughs> tooth and nail uh, for immigrants and for refugees and for all the values that we believe in. Thank you very much. <laughs>
so much um, for having me. Thanks to Peter and the other organizers and the members of the Law Review for convening this, um, this conference. I um, am going to talk um, from experience of litigating two cases over the past nine months, one challenging the first Muslim ban and the second challenging the termination of DACA. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about the role that constitutional claims play in each case, um, both legally and socially. And here up front, I want to say um, this is a panel about international law and constitutional law in relation to immigration law. And I'm going to talk about constitutionalism in both legal and social terms. I, um, because the um, litigation around the Muslim ban, which is now in its third iteration, and the DACA termination litigation are both ongoing, I'm going to be mostly descriptive so as not to veer uh, into strategic considerations in the litigation. But I hope to provide at least a preliminary set of reflections on the work that constitutional claims are doing in each litigation. And my basic claim is that while these cases are important for the doctrinal issues involved, not least of which is the scope of uh, executive, the executive's immigration power, they're equally important in relation to the social activism they enable for the populations most direct affected by each policy, Muslims on the one hand and Latinos on the other. These cases are, in important ways, constitutive of Muslims and Latinos in the United States as they help to define the social and political meaning of Muslim and Latino identity. Put uh, another way, these cases are constitutional, both legally and socially. So let me begin with a brief description of the, of the Muslim ban litigation, um, focusing in particular on the case um, in which my students in the clinic I co-teach, uh, colleagues there, um, and other organizations, and I were involved. When the first Muslim ban was involved, this is Muslim ban 1.0, uh, late in the afternoon on Friday, January 27th, one week to the day after the presidential inauguration, it quickly led to chaos. Um, the executive order was hastily drafted, inadequately vetted, and rolled out at airports across the, the, the country with only haphazard gui guidance to frontline customs and border protection officials. With, within hours, those CBP officials were detaining and excluding people pursuant to the ban, including green card holders and dual citizens. So at approximately 10 o'clock that Friday night, <clears throat> my colleague Mike Wishney got a call from our alumna, Becca Heller, who runs the International Refugee Assistance Project, or IRAP. Becca reported that one of IRAP's clients, a man named Hamid Khalid Darwish, was being detained at JFK Airport in New York on the basis of, Muslim, of the Muslim ban. Now, Mr. Darwish um, was an Iraqi citizen who had been granted a special immigrant visa, or SIV, by virtue of his service to the United States military in Iraq as an interpreter, engineer, and contractor over the course of a decade. He was coming to the United States and qualified for the visa precisely because of that service and the fact that that service put his life in jeopardy if he were to remain in Iraq. When he arrived uh, at JFK with his family, he was detained. By 11 o'clock that night, a group of faculty and students uh, from our clinic were on the phone with lawyers from IRAP, the National Immigration Law Center, and the ACLU to plot a legal strategy. Our students and colleagues worked through the night, uh, literally through the night, and at 5.33 a.m. the next morning, that Saturday, we filed a nationwide class action habeas corpus suit on behalf of all individuals detained on the basis of the Muslim ban. Later that day, we filed a motion to stay the executive order. Shortly after 7 p.m., Judge Ann Donnelly in the U.S. District Court in Brooklyn held a Saturday night hearing um, to a packed courtroom of people who had been protesting at JFK Airport and got messages largely through social media that they should redirect to Cadman Plaza in Brooklyn, and they all descended on the courthouse um, on a Saturday night. And the court security, when I talked to them to say, is this a public hearing, put me on hold and said, let me check, and came back and said, the judge says, the courthouse is open. Tell people to get here early. <laughs> the courtroom was full and there were hundreds of people outside the courtroom. And shortly after 8 p.m., Judge Donnelly issued a nationwide stay 
enjoining the detention or exclusion of anyone on the basis of the Muslim ban executive order. This was roughly 22 hours after we began working on the case. Um, I often tell my students we should just quit now and <laughs> else because we'll never be as successful in such a short period of time as we went then. But um, let me talk about the complaint. Um, the complaint, which was literally drafted overnight, included procedural due process claims that the Muslim ban unlawfully deprived un individuals of the ability to apply for as asylum and protections under the Convention Against Torture, and a statutory claim that the ban violated the Administrative Procedure Act, as well as the statutory anti-discrimination provision of the INA, which has been talked about already, um, Section 1152A. Um, and in three sentences in the complaint, we allege a violation of the Equal Protection Component of the Due Process Clause on the basis of discrimination um, uh, of, uh, on the basis of national origin and animus toward Muslims. Um, one of those sentences, one of those three sentences in the complaint, raising that equal protection claim, is complaint boilerplate. Petitioners repeat and incorporate by reference each and every allegation in the preceding paragraphs as if set it, uh, forth herein. Which is to say that we had two sentences in the entire complaint that went to animus. Um, one of them contained a typo. <laughs> it's 5.33 a.m. <laughs> Notably absent from our complaint it is, is an establishment clause. Uh, claim, which became a mainstay in the many cases that followed our, ours in challenging the first Muslim ban and then the second Muslim ban and now the third Muslim ban um, as those have come out. But for the purposes of my discussion today, what matters to me is that from the very beginning of the Muslim ban litigation, we sought to constitutionalize the substantive rights at stake. Whether in terms of equal protection, as we alleged, albeit in bare form, thank you for notice pleading, um, or establishment clause protections, as later litigants alleged, the basic claim was that the Constitution protects against animus on the basis of religion. There were, as was discussed in the previous panel, multiple factual grounds for the claim of, the claim of animus. Statements by candidate Trump, statements of President Trump, the text and structure of the executive orders themselves. Um, but importantly, for the purpose of my argument, uh, and as I alluded to with regard to the courtroom protests and the airport protests, the Muslim ban litigation was accompanied from the very beginning by large-scale visible social protest. Um, I'll note here also that the airport protests began a week after the Women's March in Washington and the Women's Marches across the country. I think that is not coincidental that there was so much energy that was um, uh, available uh, in that first week of the administration. These rallies um, were principally carried out by allies of Muslims and refugees rather than Muslims and refugees themselves, but as I'll return to toward the end of my comments, they were important to an ongoing process of identity claiming um, by Muslims and by refugees. All right, let me turn and very briefly discuss the second of the two litigations that um, uh, my clinic and, uh, and I have been involved in, and this concerns the termination of DACA. So DACA was terminated <coughs> um, by um, memo from the administration issued on September 5th, and um, it stopped any new applications from coming in as of September 5th. It limited renewals of DACA um, for um, uh, uh, approximately 150,000 people. Um, and then terminated any future renewals going forward. As it happens, we, ha we had sued the Obama administration over a provision of the DACA expansion um, before the election and had a case that was pending in, as it turned out, the same courthouse in Brooklyn um, prior to the election. After the election and after um, the, the DACA was terminated, we amended that suit, a case called Bataya Vidal, um, and brought claims that the termination of DACA by the administration was unlawful. Those claims were for violations of the Administrative Procedure Act, the Regulatory Flexibility Act, which I had never heard of before we decided to include it in our complaint, <coughs> procedural due process, and equal protection. Uh, this represents a mix of procedural and substantive claims. The procedural claims involved how DACA was terminated, uh, whether notice and comment was required, whether there was um, sufficient analysis of the impact of the termination on small businesses and nonprofits. That was a Regulatory Flexibility Act claim. The substantive claims um, are first and foremost that the government action was arbitrary and capricious, 
And second, that the termination of DACA was motivated by racial animus toward Latinos and toward Mexicans in particular. Now, ours was the first case brought to challenge the termination of DACA, but there are now at least a half dozen, probably I think slightly more than that, um, cases across the country which have brought, been brought to terminate DACA, um, all of which are bringing substantially the same causes of action as we did, including the animus-based equal protection claim. To date, however, it's the Administrative Procedure Act claims, not the constitutional claims, that have garnered the court's attention, particularly uh, Judge Alsop's court in Northern California and Judge Garifuss's court um, in the Eastern District of New York, where we are. And in both of those courts, in California and in New York, the parties are engaged currently in fairly pitched battles over what counts as the administrative record, whether the government is required to produce a privilege log of documents that not in the administrative record, and what discovery, if any, the parties can take in relation to the Administrative Procedure Act claim. But I want to suggest that people and movements are not animated by the Administrative Procedure Act, um, much less by the Regulatory Flexibility Act. Put another way, these technocratic statutes that govern the operation of the administrative state do not typ typically resonate with the lived experience of people. And so if you talk to dreamers, um, if you talk to United We Dream, the largest organization of dreamers in the country and one of our clinic's clients, if you talk to dreamers across the country, it's a sense of racial targeting that most deeply resonates and not a sense of procedural irregularity in the way that the program was terminated. Note then that there's an important difference between the Muslim ban litigation and the DACA litigation. In the Muslim ban litigation, there was significant congruence between the animus-based legal claims that were both made and gained most traction in the courtroom and the lived experience of, the ta of targeting of affected communities. In contrast, in the DACA litigation, there is at least to date a significant incongruity between the claims gaining traction in court and those that resonate with the affected population. This may well change as the litigation unfolds. We have been in it for all of um, uh, a month and a week. But at least up until now, the equal protection claims have figured far more prominently outside of the courtroom than in when it comes to DACA. All right, so let me end with a few <coughs> reflections about um, constitutional claims and the constitution of identity. Robert Cover described law as, quote, a resource and signification that enables us to submit, rejoice, struggle, pervert, mock, disgrace, humiliate, or dignify, uh, end of quote. Well, which kind of work the law does, whether it rejoices or struggles or disgraces, humiliates, or dignifies, depends upon the narratives that are constructed with and around the law. <coughs> Narrative context fixes the meaning of law, legal institutions, doctrine, and legal practice, because it's fundamentally and inextricably embedded in narrative. Cover wrote further, and here I'm quoting again, no set of legal institutions or prescriptions exists apart from the narratives that locate it and give it meaning. For every constitution, there is an epic. For every Decalogue, a scripture. Once understood in the context of the narratives that give it meaning, law becomes not merely a system of rules to be observed, but a world in which we live. So I want to, in closing, ask, borrowing from cover, what is our epic? Uh, what is the world, the law-inflected world, in which we live today? And I want to suggest that this is an epic of national redefinition. It's a maxim of, in, of international law. The sovereignty uh, includes the power. In fact, at base is the power to decide whom to admit and whom to exclude. But just as it was a mistake to consider the Chinese Exclusion Act, distinct from the social context of anti-Chinese and anti-Asian animus in the country at that time, as was discussed in the prior presentation, it's a mistake to consider the Muslim ban in isolation from the larger politics of the current moment, or to consider the DACA termination in isolation from those larger politics. When viewed in the context of racially hostile comments by the president, anti-immigrant policies by the administration, 
and a hostility toward protest against police brutality toward African Americans. It becomes clear that the Muslim ban is part of a larger project of national reconstitution, just as the, is the termination of DACA. And this same context supports an argument that the termination of DACA is the policy enactment of a racially expressed nativism. And so when Donald Trump says we're not a country if we can't control our borders, he's not merely paraphrasing a maxim of international law. Rather, he's deploying sovereignty in this political moment and as directed to his audience as a code word. And so I want to suggest that we are in this moment of national contest over national identity. And this is, in both legal and social dimensions, a constitutional contest. It's in this context that the Muslim ban and the DACA litigation must be understood. Not to put too fine a point on it, but the deployment of racial and religious animus is consistent with an ethno-nationalist reimagination of the country, or reconstituting, or reconstitutionalizing of the nation. This dovetails with Peter Margulies' point in the last panel that the Muslim ban effectively curtails legal immigration of particular kinds of immigrants. The number of immigrants goes down, and the type of immigrant changes. And so too does the constitution of the country. And this is why the constitutional claims in these litigations matter. These cases are about basic questions of membership, and not merely procedural irregularities in the announcement of policy. And these claims matter as much outside the court as inside, for the reasons that cover sites. Law is a resource in social practice, and this may be especially true of constitutional law. Just as a rich and thick set of social practices changed our understandings of gay rights, such that we could travel, we could travel the constitutional distance from Bowers versus Hardwick in 1986 to Lawrence versus Texas in 2004, so too may our constitutional understandings of belonging of Muslims and Latinos change with rich, with rich and thick social practice. To put this in slightly different terms, and I'll end here, activists can be constitutionalists. Take, for example, dreamers. Dreamers have been engaged in their own radical constitutionalism for the better part of a decade. They have been claiming that they are American even before the law has granted them formal recognition. That's a radical act. It's an act of anticipating the law and willing the law through activism rather than waiting for conferral of it, whether from Congress or from the courts. And in doing so, the dreamers, like the airport protest protesters following the first Muslim ban, make demands as to what the law must be, and they enact what the law must be. These social practices then help to constitute the law, and these social actors, and not merely the lawyers, may be the constitutionalists that matter most. Thank you. While we're getting started, uh, let me uh, also thank the students, the faculty, the administration, and soon the IT staff uh, <laughs> for all their work in putting together the presentations uh, today and for including me. Uh, and I'd like to especially thank uh, my co-panelists for such insightful and eloquent remarks. Uh, my focus today is going to be on borders, bans, and migrants in Europe. There we go. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to draw your attention to a recent case uh, decided by the European Union Court of Justice. Uh, on September 6, 2017, the day after Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced the termination of DACA, the European Court of Justice issued a judgment in an important case <laughs> in which a member state at the frontier, think Texas, uh, sued the central government, you know what that is, uh, for acting unlawfully in applying temporary measures to protect vulnerable immigrants. This case, which got all the way to the highest court of the uh, European Union, began at the borders of Europe. 
and that's where I'd like to start. Uh, on the screen, you see in dark blue the 28 nations of the European Union. The European Union has an asylum law, which has a venue statute <coughs> known in the European uh, vocabulary as the Dublin Regulation. What this venue statute says, in short, is that in most instances, undocumented migrants have to apply for asylum in the first country in the EU in which they set foot. As you look at the map, you can imagine that the first country in which they set foot is likely to be a country on the eastern uh, frontier of the European Union, or to some extent, if they come by boat and step out of the boat, on the southern uh, frontier. So Greece, Italy, Hungary, Slovakia, Romania. Um, now, not only does this mean that the number of asylum seekers and the place of their asylum adjudication is apportioned uh, in a very uneven uh, setting, uh, but in a very unfair setting. This map shows you essentially the wealth of the European countries. Darker is richer. Uh, so any asylum seekers that pass through the frontier countries uh, into the interior, the further north, the further west they go, um, are sent back, pursuant to the Dublin regulation, to the poorer countries with less capacity at the border. Um, as you can imagine, this creates uh, significant problems. One last map to show you uh, on this. This uh, shows you, in the light green, the Schengen zone. Schengen is an agreement of 26 countries, not all EU countries, um, and not all EU countries are part of it. You can see the UK and Ireland uh, up there are, uh, have brought themselves outside Schengen. But if you're a country in the Schengen zone, in the Schengen agreement, you agree that there will be no internal border controls. Uh, so anybody who lands in your country and goes through border controls for the first time has free movement totally within this 26 country zone. Now, all of these um, borders uh, and geographic areas and areas of movement have had great pressure uh, in recent years in terms of the increasing numbers of asylum seekers in the European Union. And this graph shows you, look at the dark blue line, at, that's the number of first-time <coughs> asylum applicants. Just gives you a sense of how quickly and how dramatically the numbers of asylum seekers have increased in the EU in recent years. So, you know, roughly 2009, 200,000 asylum seekers in all 28 countries in the EU. By 2000, uh, 13, we were up to 400,000. 214, it rose to 625,000. And then 2015, the year that broke the bank, uh, over 1.2 million asylum seekers uh, filed applications for asylum. Uh, and you can see that in the next year, 2016, and this surprised me, I think it might surprise you too, another 1.2 million first-time asylum applications were filed in the EU. So the system was staggering under sudden large, large increases of numbers. Uh, and it's not just numbers. As, as Mara Lorza told us this morning, it's people walking with very uh, few possessions and with their children. This is a picture of Syrian asylum seekers walking from Greece through the fields of Hungary in the summer of 2015. Um, and what happened? Uh, Hungary built a fence. Uh, <laughs> here you can see uh, on the southern border of Hungary, between Hungary and Serbia, uh, the first efforts to put up physical barriers in the summer of 2015 to prevent asylum seekers from uh, accessing the EU. Uh, and it wasn't just Hungary. You can see other fences were being built uh, that same summer. Um, and those fences didn't stop enough people, all they started is slowing it down. Uh, and as people, this is a picture in Budapest, uh, again from 2015, uh, marching towards the European Union, and in particular towards Austria and Germany, um, what happened in the Schengen Agreement? 
uh, now you should look at the black lines, uh, many of the Schengen countries, at least five important ones, Austria, Germany, um, and Sweden, the ones I want to emphasize, reimposed border controls. So what we saw in a very short time, and what we continue to see, um, is an erection of borders uh, and in an effort to stop asylum seekers from becoming, from being able to place their claims in the European Union. Um, this created a lot of backlash uh, and a lot of social consternation. Uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban, uh, infamously said, uh, we are guarding the gates of Christian Europe. Uh, in Poland, people were marching, uh, saying, today refugees, tomorrow terrorists, Poland free of Islam. Uh, in Slovakia, the interior minister in August 2015 said, Slovakia is a Christian country and we can help Christians from Syria. Uh, find a new home. And most of these asylum seekers in the summer of 2015, the large, large, large majority, were from Syria uh, and had come through Turkey and had been displaced by war and persecution. Uh, so this was a very uh, terrible, tenuous, tumultuous time in the European Union. And the European Union Council, members of each of the 28 governments um, uh, spent many hours many, uh, trying, to, trying to come up with plans uh, to respond both publicly and politically to these crises. In the September of 2015, I'm going to cut to the chase here, uh, they passed a plan which they hoped would relieve some of the pressure on the border states that I mentioned before. And in particular, looking where the migrant flows were coming in July and August of 2015, they said that there would be a relocation from Hungary of 54,000 asylum seekers who would be moved to other countries in the EU who had fewer asylum seekers and would have their cases adjudicated there. <coughs> and if they got asylum, would be integrated there. Uh, 50,000 from Greece, which was uh, reeling with large, large numbers of asylum seekers. 15,000 from Italy, uh, because at this particular moment, fewer people were coming to Italy. Now, what the EU Council said is that we need to do this. This is a, this is a European-wide crisis. We need to act together. We need to have solidarity. We need to share the responsibility to act. And so this relocation of 120,000 uh, asylum seekers uh, is going to take place according to a certain formula. Uh, each country, depending upon its population, its, its GDP, its unemployment rate, would get a certain portion of these people. The EU would, would give 6,000 euros per asylum seeker who was relocated. Um, and those who would be eligible for relocation were those asylum seekers who came from groups of which the prior quarter's uh, approval rate for asylum had been more than 75%. So they were relocating people. It was a pretty good bet that many of them had valid claims. Hungary demurred, said, take your 54,000. We don't want your stinking 54,000. Leave us out of this. Uh, we don't want to be part of it. And in fact, we are going to oppose and ban any refugees from coming to Hungary uh, at all. The council proceeded. Uh, it passed uh, by a vote of 23 to 5, I think. Hungary, Slovakia, Czech Republic, and <coughs> Romania were objecting. Uh, passed this relocation plan. Um, and started the process. Slovakia and Hungary, as you can see from this slide, went to court. They sued the EU Council. Um, and for those of you who have been following uh, the DACA litigation in particular, uh, their legal claims will sound very familiar, as will uh, the format of the litigation. Oops, sorry, let me go, I went the wrong way. Poland intervened on the side of Slovakia and Hungary. Uh, 
Seven other EU states and the EU Commission intervened on the side of the Council. Uh, there were oral arguments, briefing. Uh, the big claim was the EU Council is trying to legislate. It's stealth legislation in disguise using executive power, uh, saying they're protecting temporarily uh, asylum seekers. They are, in fact, arrogating to themselves power they don't have. Uh, there were also similar uh, to our situation in the United States, notice and comment kind of claims. Uh, they didn't give the right kind of notice to the member state parliaments uh, and didn't allow comment from each of the member state parliaments about their plan. Uh, and the two uh, substantive arguments were this is disproportional, it's too intrusive on the sovereignty uh, and the economies of the states that would receive relocated asylum seekers, and the council didn't use the least restrictive means available. Uh, the European Court of Justice last month uh, resoundingly rejected every one of the claims. It was a 15-member uh, panel of uh, a grand chamber of the European Court of Justice, uh, and they affirmed the power and the, the, the propriety of the Council, um, saying that EU institutions must be allowed broad discretion when adopting measures that entail choices, particularly those of a particular nature that involve complex assessments. They ordered Slovakia and Hungary to pay the costs of uh, the EU Council um, and to comply with the order. Now, what's happened in the intervening five weeks? Uh, it, is, it is early uh, to say what's really happened, but you probably won't be surprised to know that the Prime Minister of Hungary uh, said this is a political decision, it's an illegitimate court, uh, used the language of sexual violence to say the EU is raping Hungary, uh, and then said, uh, you know, this fence that Hungary put up helped all of the EU because it's keeping out those asylum seekers and terrorists. Um, and so the EU should pay for it uh, and presented a bill for 400 million euros to the EU. Uh, now, he is not the only person in Hungary or in the EU or in the Visegrad countries. There are many people rallying uh, in uh, Hungary and elsewhere in favor of not only of the court judgment but of the initial uh, court uh, EU Council decisions to uh, help with the refugee relocation um, that was ordered. Um, Slovakia, I must say, has um, relented, has pledged to work uh, with the EU Council. Um, so I think we're seeing some movement. Um, I think it's soon, um, and I, I can't give you a definitive answer of what's going to happen, um, but we certainly see resonances across the Atlantic uh, to uh, what we're seeing in the United States. Uh, and I have to conclude with a somewhat pessimistic note, um, the fence is still there. This is the Hungary-Serbia border. Uh, and as in this picture, I think the future is cloudy. Thank you. We're going to hear from our last uh, panelist, Peter Schock, Professor Emeritus of Media Law School. Let me add my voice to the chorus of praise for those who have organized the conference and uh, and, and my thanks for including me in this. Uh, when Peter invited me, uh, the question arose as to what I should talk about. Uh, I had just published a book which uh, has a chapter on immigration policy, and um, uh, that was what I thought I would talk about. But I also told him that I had just completed a draft uh, uh, along with my, with my uh, colleague, uh, my writing colleague, uh, Roger Smith, uh, professor at the University of Pennsylvania, um, of a book that we had published in, in <coughs> uh, eight, 1985 
concerning birthright citizenship um, in light of the uh, new circumstances that have arisen that make that a hotter issue uh, even than it was in 1985, and he uh, urged me to talk about that. So uh, that's, uh, that's the occasion for uh, my discussion of birthright citizenship. So this book that I mentioned <coughs> earlier, um, uh, its single most important claim, uh, certainly its most novel and controversial one, was that birthright citizenship for the U.S.-born children of undocumented aliens is not constitutionally mandated, as had previously universally, almost universally agreed, uh, but instead remains a matter of policy choice for, uh, for Congress. Um, that was uh, greeted with uh, uh, some chill uh, by uh, immigration scholars, um, and uh, although we had certainly not in the in the uh, book uh, uh, favored any uh, eliminate uh, favored uh, abrogation of birthright citizenship, we argued that Congress has the political authority, uh, the constitutional authority to uh, to do that, uh, and we considered the arguments pro and con. Um, um, in the almost 35 years since we wrote it, some elements of the decision environment in which Congress would, if it chose, under our interpretation, uh, consider this policy um, have changed, other conditions have not. What has changed, and decidedly so, is the political and policy environment, and that's why this is uh, relevant to uh, today's uh, conference uh, with regard to the um, Trump administration's um, plans for our immigration policy. Um, uh, we argue that six conditions have changed somewhat uh, since, uh, since we wrote the book. First, uh, President Trump's public statements about birthright citizenship uh, for this group, that is the, the U.S.-born children of uh, undocumented uh, uh, immigrants. The size of the group in question, the pros and cons of the current practice, public attitudes on the issue, other liberal democracies' practices, and possible reforms short of uh, outright repeal of uh, current birthright citizenship uh, regime. Uh, so I'm going to very, very quickly uh, mention those, uh, uh, those uh, six uh, uh, developments, uh, just to sort of update our understanding of what the uh, environment, policy environment is. Uh, in a policy paper released uh, on August 15, 2015, candidate Trump stated that birthright, birthright citizenship is the biggest magnet for illegal immigration, which is preposterous, uh, but uh, so or most of the things he says. In fact, I wanna, at this point, I want to make a plug for a limerick uh, <laughs> that I wrote, a 22-stanza limerick uh, about Trump um, <clears throat> published on July 5th in Huffington Post. Uh, called Trump's America. Uh, so, and I'm happy to send it to you if you, if you email <laughs> me about it. Um, ten days later, in a heated exchange with Univision anchor uh, Jorge Ramos while on the campaign trail in Iowa, Trump questioned whether the 14th Amendment provides birthright citizenship to the children of undocumented persons. Quote, a woman is getting ready to have a baby. She crosses the border for one day, has the baby all of a sudden for the next 80 years, hopefully longer, but for the next 80 years, we have to take care of the people. No, 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 I don't think so. Excuse and it was normal uh, eloquence. Excuse me, <laughs> some of the greatest legal scholars, and I know some of these television scholars, referring to Ramos, agree with you, uh, but uh, some of the great legal scholars agree that that's not true. These are great legal scholars, the top, that say that's absolutely wrong. I have uh, sometimes said that my five-year-old granddaughter is, has a larger vocabulary than uh, President Trump, and I'm thinking of writing a, another limerick about um, what would happen if, as Trump proposed, uh, um, he and Tillerson were uh, to take an IQ test <laughs> administered perhaps by, um, by Mensa. So I'm, if you have any ideas for that, Limerick, let me, let me know. Uh, Trump advanced no specific proposal for how he would change the birthright citizenship rule, and in office he said little or nothing, literally uh, uh, nothing about it. Um, and 
it, it, just a week ago when he uh, released his uh, immigration reform proposals, he said nothing about birthright citizenship, which is, uh, which is very striking. Whether that he will maintain that silence in the future is, um, is, is a question. Um, so the second is the size of the group of uh, uh, U.S.-born uh, children of uh, undocumented parents. Um, and uh, I discuss in this, in this uh, update, uh, the, or we discuss, the, uh, the dimensions of the population. And I'll just give you a couple of data points, because um, nobody's really sure uh, what the size is for obvious reasons. Uh, the share of the U.S.-born children of unauthorized immigrants has been increasing over the past two decades. This likely is related to the fact that, that uh, <coughs> long-term residents constitute a rising share of unauthorized uh, immigrants. It's a very important uh, and little understood uh, phenomenon. In 2014, two-thirds of adult unauthorized immigrants had lived in the U.S. for a decade or more, compared with 41% in 2000. Now, it's, it's well known and an important fact that the mixed status families are very, very common in the United States. Um, but the, the residential patterns uh, and the um, uh, uh, duration of those patterns, uh, I think, is an important new um, ingredient in the uh, policy uh, mix. Um, a third development uh, that has surged since our book appeared is the heightened nationalist and anti-immigrant views exhibited by voters in most of the world's liberal democracies. Canada, so far, is the exception. Uh, this populist resistance to even legal immigration uh, <laughs> makes uh, birthright citizenship for the children of undocumented immigrants even more politically anomalous and unpopular uh, than ever uh, before. Uh, now, it's to public attitudes. The most recent survey on the question, conducted by NBC News and the Wall Street Journal and published in uh, just a, a, a few weeks ago, found that 53% of respondents thought that, quote, we should continue to grant citizenship to all children born in the United States. 42% opined that this should be changed so that um, uh, children of illegal immigrants are not automatically granted citizenship. Um, now, it, it's important that, to note that these questions are uh, asked uh, often about whether the Constitution should be changed uh, and that the public is generally against constitutional change uh, for, for anything. So, um, uh, neither of these surveys asked respondents whether, assuming that the Constitution does allow Congress to legislate on the matter, as our uh, uh, book had uh, argued, um, uh, Congress sh should adopt a different policy by statute. Um, so the, presumably the respondents are, were not considering that possibility. Um, and of course it did not ask whether Congress should adopt an intermediate position uh, uh, mod which I have proposed, um, modifying the birthright citizenship rule. Uh, as far as other countries' practices are concerned, <coughs> pardon me, the U.S. is distinctive and in some cases unique among nations in many ways relevant to citizenship policy. Our comparatively open legal immigration policies before the 1920s and since 1965, our remarkable tradition of ethno-racial and religious diversity our large and growing illegal immigrant population, which partly reflects our very long land border with a vastly poorer uh, region, our comparatively easy, non-culturally based naturalization requirements, um, uh, our commitment to legal equality, and finally, our constitutionally based commitment to birthright citizenship. Given these differences, it is unsurprising that the citizenship rules of other liberal democracies differ from those of the U.S. in some important respects, including birthright citizenship. Jus sanguinis, citizenship based on the citizenship of one's parents rather than on where the one is born, it's called jus soli, is far from common, I'm sorry, is far more common than birthright citizenship, which emerged from 
a very unique English common law uh, tradition. No European country accords citizenship based simply on birth in its territory. Indeed, a number of countries with traditionally unqualified je soli rules, that is, uh, 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 citizenship attributed simply by reason of birth uh, in the uh, territory, um, have um, recently abolished or adopted limits on je soli, conditioning the child's birthright citizenship on the parent's birth in the country or legal residence status, the parents. Uh, this is true of Australia and New Zealand, and also uh, the UK. So it's important to understand that uh, there are many liberal democracies uh, uh, that do, do, have not adopted our uh, particular uh, 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 rule as it's been <coughs> traditionally understood. Um, so I think the notion that liberal democracies uh, all would subscribe to our current regime is, uh, is, is simply false. Now, it may be that that's an irrelevant consideration, but uh, one ought to uh, uh, understand that as part of the context. In general, a global trend has developed in which traditionally just solely countries, the UK and Ireland, for example, either restrict birthright citizenship to the legal residency status of at least one parent, or repeal its just solely provisions altogether. Again, the notable, notable exception uh, uh, to this is Canada, uh, which like the US does not require that a parent of the Canadian born or Canada born child have legal status. This feature of Canada's rule, like ours, is controversial and seems likely to become more so as illegal immigration to Canada increases. Um, in another trend, some traditionally just sanguinous countries have added just solely elements to their citizenship laws, but usually, if not always, conditioned on the parents' own birth or residency status. Um, so um, uh, we, we really are an outlier in, in, uh, in this respect, with the, uh, with the important exception of, uh, of Canada, which doesn't, again, does not have the um, uh, does not face the um, uh, large-scale um, undocumented um, migration uh, that the United States uh, does. And I'm going to conclude with a possible intermediate position which I have proposed for those who are uh, who believe that Congress uh, does as, as we show uh, I think clearly in uh, relying on the constitutional and historical materials, uh, that Congress does have the power to change the uh, current um, uh, understanding of the birthright citizenship uh, rule, um, uh, th that uh, this, th there, there is a, another uh, approach to this which is not um, either eliminating birthright citizenship for all uh, uh, children born in the United States of undocumented parents um, or um, uh, maintaining this, the status quo. As we noted in the book, uh, the existing role of unrestricted birthright citizenship, even for children of unauthorized immigrant parents and so-called, and these, these terms are very derogatory, uh, but they're used constantly, so I'm going to use them, uh, for our purposes today, so-called birth tourists or anchor babies, has a number of advantages even though it flagrantly violates the consent principle of the, at the heart of democratic government, a consent principle that we argue in our book was uh, what animated the uh, uh, citizenship, the conception of the citizenship clause um, uh, in, uh, in the 14th Amendment. Um, uh, <clears throat> the existing rule has a number of advantages, even though it flagrantly violates the consent principle at the heart of democratic uh, government, as well as creating perverse incentives for illegal entrance and, uh, and overstays. Change in the birthright citizenship rule, uh, our book argued, can be done by congressional statute. Um, I proposed a reform that promises to achieve a better combination of advantages and disadvantages, again, if one wants to uh, 
uh, alter the, uh, the status quo. For this target group, it would sub substitute retroactive to birth citizenship for the U.S.-born children of Ill illegal immigrant parents and, de and demonstrate a substantial attachment to and familiarity with this country by satisfying two conditions. First, a certain period of residence here after birth and a certain level of education in our schools. In almost every case, of course, the two conditions will overlap and the schooling will assure at least a minimal level of proficiency in English and knowledge of American uh, society. Reasonable people can differ about what the qualifying periods of residence and education should be, whether those periods must be continuous and other considerations. Uh, in my view, completion of eighth grade should suffice for this limited period and certifying these facts to the government should be administratively simple. During the interim period, the individual should have the legal status of presumptive citizen with all the attributes of citizenship for individuals of their age. The parent status would remain the same as under current law. Now, I haven't addressed here the issue of legalization, which I do discuss in the chapter of my book that uh, 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 Peter advised me to uh, not to present uh, in favor of this. One can easily, easily imagine ob objections to this reform, especially by those who categorically reject birthright citizenship for this group on grounds that we've already discussed. But two answers to such objections are obvious and in our view compelling. First, whether Americans like it or not, these children are now legally citizens at birth. Second, the normative objections to their citizenship that their connection to our country is imposed without our consent and is often adventitious, transient, transient, and insubstantial would be met by the proposed reform whose enactment would provide the requisite consent to and conditions for their citizenship. Uh, thank you. Uh, but quick question, this is for Mary Ellen, but I'm happy to have responses from everyone, uh, Peter and everyone else. Mary Ellen, I, I had sort of a mixed view about your presentation because on one hand it was optimistic about the Court of Justice of the European Union, but you ended up saying, I think rightly, that the outlook is somewhat cloudy. Uh, to me, that latter, more pessimistic outlook is reinforced by the results, for example, of the German election where Angela Merkel was reelected, but she's still trying to put together a coalition. And this is in a German parliament where you also have a far right party that has gotten unprecedented levels of public support. And that party has its main plank and platform, uh, anti-immigration. Uh, so is that a cautionary tale for the U.S., and does that mean, therefore, that what Steve was saying before about how Obama's pro-immigration measures had nothing to do with the election of Trump, maybe that was a little overstated, and at least in terms of looking at this as a matter of multiple causation, as everything is in the world, uh, pro-immigration policies do have a backlash here as well. Well, um, let me say I will address it very uh, superficially and simply given that we all want to go to lunch uh, very, <laughs> very quickly. Um, and I, I want to go back to Matthew, the first speaker today, uh, kind of the invasion of <clears throat> foreigners is always with us. Uh, it's with us in Europe, it's with us in the United States, uh, and I don't think this is anything new. And, and I do think similar, uh, concerns about foreigners or about culture being changed. Uh, we're seeing those fears in the United States. We're seeing them in Germany. We're seeing them in France. But I do want to point out that France did not elect Le Pen. Uh, so it's a very <coughs> mixed um, bag. I, I have a lot to say about uh, the 200,000 limit on refugees uh, that, that Angela Merkel has said that she would be a condition for uh, joining with um, other coalition parties. but. That's too much for now. Uh, so maybe over lunch, uh, I can kind of expand on my ideas there. But I do think, Peter, and just to, to since I have the floor for just a moment, um, 
it is, not, it is more than immigration. I mean, the EU has been struggling with how to form a <coughs> supranational uh, entity. Um, and uh, even before the immigration crisis flared, uh, and I think it's all shaking down, I think the, the court opinion I talked about is gonna be important uh, far beyond the immigration context or the refugee context. Um, and so I think uh, when I was saying it's too soon to tell and it's somewhat uncertain, I, I think that's all part of the mix. Thank you.